All right, so we're going to touch on these four topics. And uh, because this is about women of the Bible and specifically Delilah, we, we're really going to focus primarily on that first bullet point around who Delilah was. Um, but to give some context to Delilah's life and to her short story, it, it would be very helpful to have a look at Samson's own story because it's, a, as we know, and it's a story we all know very, very well, a, a very powerful story. And it really gives some context to trying to understand Delilah herself. And then just to finish off, we'll have a look specifically at what we learn from Scripture around Delilah's particular role in Samson's life. And then we'll take some lessons, if we can, from the passages that we've considered. So if we look firstly at who Delilah was, well, her, her introduction to us and her, her, her um, focus of our attention is really in a very, very short passage, uh, or very short number of passages in Judges chapter 16. In fact, she doesn't even fill the whole of chapter 16. She just comes in very swiftly in chapter 4, plays a very significant and pivotal role, and by verse 21, she's really exited from our lives altogether. And when I was putting the presentation together and trying to do some research, there were there was at least one article which suggested, and that's why I've put that second bullet point in, that the Delilah was possibly also in attendance at the crescendo of our story around Samson, which we know very well it was when he was brought out to the temple and uh, his strength had returned, and he was able to topple the pillars of the temple and bring it down. And there's a suggestion that Delilah was in attendance at that time as well. And I've put it in more just because I think it's something that we need to warn ourselves against rather than I can find any sort of evidence to suggest he was, certainly not in Judges chapter 16. If there's some other reference later on or earlier on in the Bible that might help us, but I can't find any reference in chapter 16 to Delilah okay. continuing or being at that particular event. Um, and perhaps the point really to emphasize now is we need to be careful, particularly when we have these very powerful stories with very short um, <clears throat> excuse me, very short um, experiences of particular role players. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, we just need to be careful that we don't add too much and we don't add supposition or embellish any of the truth because it, in some respects, although it may make the story sound a bit smoother, it may make it sound a bit more exciting, it isn't necessarily, uh, firstly, what... Uh, actually happened. And secondly, it is perhaps detracting from the key point. And as we'll see towards the end, I think there is a very simple but a very powerful key point to Delilah's life and to her particular role in Samson's story. So if we look a little bit more carefully around Delilah and, and who she was, um, firstly, there's some difficulty in trying to understand what her name means, because uh, as I put up on the first bullet point there, Bible Gateway, which I'm sure many of you use, certainly I use it a lot when I'm um, trying to find an electronic Bible. It's very helpful just because of the number of different versions of the Bible that it, it offers you. But they've got a whole section there which deals with um, women of the Bible. And in it, they, they have a particular chapter on Samson's story and Delilah. And there they indicate that Delilah's name means delicate or the dainty one. And whether that's taken from a more modern language, from French or Greek or one of the other more modern languages, I don't know. But certainly when you research a little bit further and you look at more ancient uh, interpretations, that doesn't really seem to bear itself out. So I've suggested below that that there are two better meanings and they seem to line up quite nicely. Um, and the first one is I took from this book by Cheryl Exum, around a Jewish woman, a comprehensive historical encyclopedia, where she suggests that the word Delilah is in fact derived from Hebrew and it's a play, a word play on the Hebrew word Layla, which means night. And the second reference I took, which as I say, seems to line up quite nicely with that is from brother Harry Whitaker and his book on Judges and Ruth, where he indicates that, that Delilah's name means one, she who brings low or the night vulture. So you can see some correlation between the two definitions. And if we drill a little bit deep, it actually gets even more interesting because Delilah, if we accept, means night. Um, I understand that Samson in uh, Hebrew is Shimshan, which sounds uh, somewhat like when I was in my younger days at university and some of my friends may have had too much to drink, where they uh, described my name. 
But that, um, uh, that is again a play on the Hebrew word of Shemesh, which means the sun. And sun, we know from the Bible, means strength or invincibility, and that certainly lines up very neatly with, with what Samson's life was all about and the strength that we know that he had. And Delilah, her name meaning night, really suggests that in this particular story, Delilah or night overcomes Samson's strength or the sun. And I think it's important to emphasize, though, that that doesn't mean that evil or Delilah overcame God's power, or God's purpose, but he overcame God's, oh, sorry, Samson's strength, or the sun, in order to fulfill God's purpose. I put a question mark next to that because that's something we could possibly discuss or debate if, if you feel that's stretching it too far. But it really lines up quite neatly with exactly what happened in Samson's story. Here, here was uh, Samson with all the strength, and it took this uh, lady, known for some time, to overcome that strength um, through her particular guile and her, her wiliness. And, uh, and that really, as we'll see, though, was in order to fulfill God's purpose. So what does the uh, chapter, uh, Judges chapter 16 tell us about Delilah? Well, very few facts, but some important facts. So first of all, it tells us that she came from the Valley of Sorek. And I've put a map up there, and you can see in red, it indicates the Valley of Sorek. And you can see that it lies neatly. It sort of runs from the highlands uh, just to the west of Jerusalem, all the way down into the coastal plains to uh, Ashdod and Joppa. And as you can see from that particular map, at the time that Samson was born, at the time that Delilah lived there, it was the time that the Philistines lived on those coastal plains, with the Hebrews obviously living more to the, to the east of that around Jerusalem and those other towns that are indicated. So we know that as a, as a fact. And there's just a, a photograph. I understand that the Shorek Valley is particularly beautiful. And that's a, a photograph. You can see one of the, the rivers running through it. And as you'll see in the next, as we discuss in the next slide, those rivers sort of flow westwards all the way down to the Mediterranean Sea. So if we look at um, the valley, a, a little more detail around where she lived, the Valley of Sorek begins in the highlands, not far from Jerusalem. It uh, then twists and turns westwards towards the foothills. And at the uh, Shafela, or the valley, it then formed the border at that particular time between the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of, of Judah. And it then carries on descending down through the valleys until it reaches the coastal plain. And as I indicated on the map, that was at that time where the Philistines lived. It also had those seasonal streams, which you saw through in that photograph. And those streams used to run right down through the valley and end uh, at the Mediterranean. Now, the reality is from the little bit of information we get in Judges 16 is that Delilah could actually have lived anywhere along its course. She could have lived from the highlands in, of Judah all the way down to the coastal plains, close, much closer to the Philistines along the coast. But there's some suggestion in Judges uh, chapter 16, verse 5, that she probably lived a lot higher up. And by that, she probably lived a lot closer to the Israelite territory. And we draw that conclusion from the fact that Judges uh, verse 5 in chapter 16 talks about the Philistines going up, or they went up to Delilah, suggesting that they had to go up from the coastal plains where they lived up to find Delilah, who was presumably living higher up uh, in the highlands of the valley. Now, there's two important points that when you do a bit of research on Delilah, and I think even from when we taught the story as, uh, as youngsters, that you really uh, that stand out as, as assuming or portraying the way in which Delilah was as a person. The first is that she was um, she's generally considered to have been a Philistine. And the second is that she's generally considered to have been a prostitute or a harlot. And that's a somewhat unfair um, description of her or portrayal of her, as we'll see. There's some evidence to suggest those may be fair statements, but I think there's more evidence, as you'll see, to suggest that she probably was neither. And with respect, firstly, to whether she was a Philistine or not, the case for her being one generally presented along the following lines. Firstly, we know that Samson seems to be, have been attracted to Philistine women. Uh, we know that from Judges uh, chapter 14 and verses 1 and 2, where he, he meets his wife, and, and she's clearly described in those verses as being a Philistine. And we also pick it up again in chapter 16 in verse 1, where we know that Samson 
um, met the prostitute. Now, they don't describe the prostitute as being a Philistine, but they do describe her as, as being in Gaza. And uh, my understanding from the bit of research is that in those times, Gaza would generally have been occupied by the Philistines. So there's a reasonably high probability that, that um, the prostitute was a Philistine as well. So that's the one reason that people often offer to suggest you're the Philistine, simply because he particularly seemed to like Philistine women. Someone who likes redhead women will generally look out for redhead women and, uh, and introduce himself to them. Similar sort of idea. The second reason is that she was prepared to deal with the Philistines. And the suggestion is that uh, an ancient Israelite woman probably wouldn't have been prepared to deal with them. She would have been too afraid of them. It would have been considered uh, wrong and evil to associate with them, whereas uh, Delilah seemed quite happy to engage with them and to deal with them. So perhaps a fairly powerful reason to suggest she was one of them. And the third reason offered is that she betrays an Israeli or an Israelite to his enemies. And the suggestion around this point is that the author of, of the book of Judges, if in that particular instance, would have been unlikely not to have expanded on the fact of this betrayal, particularly if she was an Israelite. So offensive would that have been, and I guess that's the same in any society, um, where you have a, one of your own who effectively betrays you. That's a particularly significant betrayal and uh, you would have expected the author then to have made a bit of a meal of that in the description of the betrayal and the fact that this was an Israelite betraying another Israelite. So uh, again, uh, not an, an unsound reason to draw the conclusion that Delilah was a Philistine. But none of these reasons, unfortunately, presents a conclusive case for saying that Delilah was in fact a Philistine. And there are a number of reasons to suggest why she may not have been. The first and most obvious one is that the Bible and Judges chapter 16, where she comes in and leaves us, makes no mention of the fact that she was a Philistine. So it doesn't describe her as a Philistine at all. Um, and conversely, um, the book of Judges does exactly the opposite with the other woman in, in um, Samson's life. It specifically refers to them as a Philistine or the area where they came from, which indicates that they were probably, uh, uh, they were probably a Philistine. The second point is that the Philistine leaders went up to her. And again, it's a point we made a little bit earlier, but it again suggests that she wasn't directly from the region. Even though the Sorek Valley went all the way down to where the Philistines live, the fact that they had to travel up to her suggests that she, in fact, didn't live close to them. And for that reason, may well not have been one of them. The third reason is that if she was a Philistine, the question was raised is why then didn't the leader simply command her to trick Samson? Compare that then with the reference to the threat that was made to Samson's wife, who we know was a Philistine, in Judges chapter 14, and verse 15. There they threatened her outright with her life uh, in order to get the information, in order to coerce her to get the information out of Samson. So why didn't they simply do the same thing to Delilah? Why did they need to bribe her? And importantly, why did they need to bribe her with so much, uh, with so much in order to do that? As we know from the scriptures, what she was offered was that each leader would give her 1,100 shekels of silver. It points out in verse 5. So that should be Judges chapter 14, obviously. What we do know is that at that time, there were five Philistine rulers, one from Ashdod, one from Ashkelon, one from Gaza, from Ekron, and from Gath. So in effect, if they were each going to give her 1,100 shekels, she was being offered some 5,500 pieces of silver. And Brother Harry Whitaker, in his um, book, in the chapter writing about this, suggests that in, in contemporary uh, value, that would have been around half a million pounds. So that's a couple of million rand that she was offered uh, by these Philistine leaders. They, they had to offer her a lot of money, uh, it seems, to get her to, to betray Samson. Again, suggesting that she may not well not have been a Philistine, uh, someone over whom they would have had far more significant control if she was. The fourth point is that she had this Hebrew name, as I've already indicated. So from that, do we suggest, was she an Israelite? Possibly, but factually, she's not identified as such in the scripture. So we can't say for sure that she was, a, was an Israelite. And one of the reasons against that is, is factually that we know from other descriptions of, of women and, and 
important Israelite figures in the Bible, but particularly women, we know that they'll often be described by describing those close male relatives around them. So you'll either have an indication that there was a husband and his name would come first, or her father, she would come from a particular father or a brother. And that's pretty typical of, of the way important Israelite figures or the Israelite figures were described in the Bible, and she isn't. So to really draw that particular point to a close, although it's not conclusive, I think it's probable more than possible, it's probable that she wasn't a Philistine. And for what it's worth, Brother Harry Whitaker in his book agrees with that. He suggests from the outset that he doesn't think that she was a Philistine. Many of the reasons that I've indicated before being the same reasons that he's got. So if we leave that point and we then consider whether Delilah was firstly a prostitute and secondly whether she was a harlot. Firstly, with respect to whether she was a prostitute, many people seem to draw that conclusion and it seems to be an unfortunate human failing of many of us that you see a name associated with other activities and you automatically associate that person with those other activities. So the first reason often given is that as she was a prostitute was simply because in but two verses before Samson meets her, he had gone off to Gaza to, to be with a prostitute, as, as explained in Judges chapter 16 and verse 1. And the second is because of the fact that she was prepared to take money to trick Samson. But importantly, uh, there's no mention in Judges chapter 16 at all that Delilah was in fact a prostitute. And again, given how specifically um, the record describes his wife and later on describes the prostitute, you would have thought that it would be quite an important point uh, if it was factually correct. So what about her if she wasn't a prostitute? What about her being a harlot? And certainly Brother Harry Whitaker viewed her as this. He has some quite strong words. And if I, if I just grab a page of it for the moment to sort of describe uh, what Brother Harry Whitaker says about her, he first of all says, Delilah, whose name means other, she who brings low, or the night vulture, as we really discussed, he says, was probably a common harlot. She had no scruples, whatever, about agreeing to betray Samson. Was she not in the trade for what she could make out of it? And then he goes on to discuss how much money those uh, 5,500 shekels was. So certainly he felt that she was. And Bible Gateway, in their chapter around Delilah, in the, in the section on all women of the Bible, and some fairly strong words to express about Delilah, and I've just set out a couple of them there just to express just how strongly they felt about her particular stature. So they talk about her being, about her using her personal charm to lure a man to his spiritual and physical destruction. And they go on to say that she stands out as one of the lowest, meanest women of the Bible. And they then say, they make the statement, a female Judas of the Old Testament. I just pause for that point because we'll come back to it in the next slide or two, but I think that's a particularly unfair statement because although there is clearly some association between what Judas did and what Delilah was prepared to do, both were prepared to take money to betray, uh, they did it in quite different circumstances. And I think that distinction is perhaps quite important. And I, perhaps here Bible Gateway is going a little too far in their suggestion of, of um, how they concluded what Delilah was all about. But they then go on to say, they don't stop there, they say she was a woman of unholy persistence and devilish deceit, who had a personal charm, mental ability, self-command and nerve, but who used all her qualities for one purpose, money. And certainly the last part of it, I think, is, is a fair statement, because we all know that ultimately she, she worked and worked and worked until she got her money and she got her reward that she clearly wanted. The other reason is that she deluded Samson into believing that she really, uh, that she really loved him. Uh, I'm not sure that's a fair statement either, because um, as you see from the record, there's nothing to suggest that she did that. Um, there's a record about how Samson felt about her, but not what she did to try and make Samson love her. So that's the case for her being a harlot. The case against it, you'll see, is a lot thinner. So perhaps it's not uh, as strong. But the case against it being a harlot is the fact that Samson, by all accounts, really fell in love with a local girl, ultimately. So after he had had a Philistine wife, after he had been with a Philistine prostitute, he seemed to then find love far closer to home. Because we know she came from the very same region that Samson had grown up in and that he lived in. You know, the regions of Zorah, Eshtaol, and Manah, 
uh, Manahed Dan. We know that from Judges chapter 13, verse 2 and 25. If we go back to the map that I'd had up earlier, you can see those towns dotted around the Sorek Valley. So quite clearly, Delilah lived in very close proximity to where Samson came from, and for that reason, may well have been one of his own, uh, one of his own Israelite people. The other perhaps more powerful reasons for suggesting um, that it's a little unfair to call Delilah um, a harlot was if we look at the converse. First of all, if you read the whole life story of Samson, if anything, he was more of the profligate, or the person of excess than Delilah is described as being. He certainly was a man of excess. And there's no mention of Delilah being or having the same sort of character. Secondly, and very, very important, you've got to remember, and this is where we come into distinguishing between what, what Judas did and what Delilah did. Delilah, you must remember, didn't hatch the plan to betray Samson. It was a plan hatched all by the Philistines on their own. Further, she didn't approach the Philistines about the idea, but conversely, the Philistines approached her. And that's the exact opposite of what happened with the case of Judas. Judas hatched his plan and then approached the Jewish leaders with the idea and sold it to them. And of course, they bought into it. The other point which you've mentioned a few times is the fact that Philistine leaders went up to her and had to entice her with significant amounts of money, a point we've already discussed. This wasn't, uh, by all accounts, a simple enticement. They really had to offer her a great deal before she was prepared to give up um, Samson. But ultimately, she, of course, did. We also know, as I've already discussed from uh, verse 4 of chapter 16, that Samson loved Delilah. Although we know, in fairness, that there's no record of the fact that she loved him. And the reality is perhaps she never did. And there's many of those relationships around nowadays as well. They've been around throughout time. It's very often where one partner sadly may love the other far more. Uh, and one may, one partner may in fact never love them. They simply feel comfortable or consoled with them or it's convenient to be with them. Uh, and that may, in truth, have made it easier for her uh, to betray him at the end of the day. But all those factors sort of build up a case to say, well, she perhaps wasn't as bad a person as we sort of start off with. She became a bad person, but she perhaps didn't start as the bad person that we all seem to jump to conclusions around her. But what do we know of her character from those few verses that we see in, in Judges chapter 16? Well, some of them are pretty obvious and some of them are pretty um, unfortunate. Uh, we know that she clearly had a weakness for money we know that she was open to being enticed, given enough money on the table. We know that she was disloyal to her partner. She was conniving. She really had to work her wiles to convince Samson over and over again to, to disclose his secret. She was wily in the way she did it. And she was persistent. And I've highlighted that particular uh, trait because, as you'll see, that really is the key to Samson's demise. In fairness, I mean, despite all of her other ugly traits that we've described there, ultimately, was her persistence which caused Samson to give in. She was also charming. She, was, she uh, sort of swooned Samson in her efforts. And we know ultimately that she was dishonest. But as I say, if we look at the record, factually, Samson's downfall was simply that. And the record confirms that when we look at Judges 16, 16. And for that matter, when we look at the, the, the weakness of, uh, of Samson around his wife as well, in Judges uh, chapter 14 and verse 17, in both instances, Samson uh, gave in to the ongoing and persistent nagging, simply the nagging uh, of his wife. And uh, sorry, I've only got my NRV version down here, my study with me. I was hoping to be able to look at my uh, other screen uh, and I could give you the uh, King James version. But, but in fairness, I actually think that the NRV description in Judges chapter 16 and verse uh, 16 is probably the more powerful one to explain exactly what happened with, with Samson. Um, so if we bring it in at, at chapter 15, the, the record then says, then she said to him, how can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? This is the third time you have made a fool of me and haven't told me the secret of your great strength. And then the important verse, chapter 16 says, with such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was sick to death of it. <laughs> Sadly, how many times is that a reality or a tru truism in many people's lives where they're simply nagged into giving up, into, uh, into giving in to, to their partner or to another person? And, uh, and Samson, that's exactly, that's, 
the bottom line of why he came in. Despite all the other ugly features of Delilah at that particular time, it was ultimately the one that did him give away his secret. So taking that important aspect of um, Delilah's life, if we just look briefly, and I've paraphrased it, and I've tried to look at Samson's story in a paraphrased way, but more to give context to Delilah's life, to try and give some explanation for some of what she did and to some of her character traits. Now, if uh, Delilah's story is very short and contained in a couple of verses in chapter 16, um, Samson's story is slightly longer. It runs, obviously, from Judges chapter 13 through to chapter 16. But it's a very powerful story, not just for the strength of Samson and the crescendo, but it's a story that moves very, very quickly. It's a story in chapter 13 where he's born, and it's, he's born in a very powerful way, as we'll look at. And by chapter 14, the hate and the, the anger has grown. He's, he's got a wife, and he's uh, already starting to, to understand the, the hate of the Philistines. And by chapter 15, it's full-blown murder on both sides of the, of the equation of chapter 16 in the crescendo of Samson's story. So a very powerful short story, but very fast moving. There's things happening throughout the story of Samson, which, um, which are very vivid and, and very um, surreal in some respects. But if we run through it quickly again, to give some context to Delilah's life, we know that he was born, we are told that he was born at the time that Israel did evil in the eyes of God, and that as a result, God had delivered the Israelites into the hands of the Philistines. So they were really under the control or the Philistines at that time. And like many, many several important characters in the Bible, uh, Samson was born to parents in a very special way. They were very special, all these sort of like Abraham and Sarah, a very special connection in terms of the birth of these important characters uh, in, in the Bible. And Samson was one of them. His parents were childless. They were unable to have children. And it was only through God's intervention that, that Samson was conceived and uh, and they were able to have a child. But very importantly, the angel that comes to tell uh, his parents that, that uh, they're going to be able to conceive is that the angel indicates that Samson would be a Naz Nazarite. And we know, and uh, I'll turn to it in a moment and just read it and explain it a little bit better, but we generally, I'm sure, know that Nazarites are those who are described in numbers as, as voluntarily take a vow. They become consecrated or separated. And Judges in chapter uh, uh, 13 and verse 7 makes a very, very important point. I think this is a very powerful point and certainly one that perhaps links uh, or for, foreshadows, as we often try and look for, foreshadows the life, the death, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because what that verse says is that the angel indicated to his parents that, that Samson was to be a Nazarite from his birth until his death. We compare that to our Lord Jesus Christ, who also had a calling from his, from his birth to his death, and in his case, to his resurrection and to his life. And the obvious important distinction to make, but nonetheless foreshadows our Lord Jesus Christ, is the fact that, that although this was Samson's calling, he was to be a Nazarite and to have his vow throughout his lifetime, he didn't live up to that, did he? He, he wavered at the point where Delilah came into the story. And he had to go through that experience in order to repent. Contrast that with our Lord Jesus Christ, who was tested, particularly, for example, and the most obvious example in the desert. And instead of giving in like Samson did, instead of giving in to the powers that had been given to our Lord Jesus Christ that were available to him, he was able to overcome that. So instead of going to his death, uh, his, his ultimate death, the way Samson did, our Lord Jesus Christ died, but was raised again of the fact that he didn't give in to or break his vow with his father throughout his lifetime. It's an important point. But if we just touch very briefly on, on a couple of verses in, in Numbers, um, and, uh, and it's uh, Numbers uh, um, chapter 6 from verses 1 through to 21, but I'll just read the first, first few verses just to explain what the Nazarites were expected to do. So in verse 1, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, If a man or woman wants to make a special vow, a vow of dedication to the Lord as a Nazarite, they must abstain from wine and other fermented drink, and must not drink vinegar, vinegar made from wine or other fermented drink. Now, I'm paraphrasing the story of Samson, but uh, those of you who know the story very well will know that when the angel came to his parents, 
what they indicated, what the angel stated to his mother was that you must not, during your um, period of pregnancy, touch any liquor at all uh, or any fermented uh, drink at all. So there was a clear correlation in terms of, of Samson's role uh, and being a Nazarite. Um, so they must abstain from wine or other fermented drink and must not drink vinegar made from wine or other fermented drink. They must not drink grape juice or eat grapes or raisins. Similar uh, command given to his, Sue Samson's parents. And it says, as long as they remain under their Nazarite vow, they must not eat anything that comes from the grape vine, uh, not even the seeds or skins. And then very importantly for our story, chapter, verse 5 of chapter 6 of Numbers says, during the entire period of the Nazarite vow, no razor may be used on their head. They must be holy until the period of their dedication to the Lord is over. They must let their hair grow long. Now, for Samson, his vow was to be a lifetime vow. So quite clearly, numbers indicates that there are certain vows that would have been made, which were for a short duration, and the rest of, of Numbers chapter 6 goes on to explain exactly when that vow would end and how it would end. But in Samson's case, his vow was to be a lifetime vow. And that's the important part, an uh, important role that he was going to play uh, in, in God's purpose for him. So his role, and we're told that from judges, is that his role was to deliver the Israelites from the hands of the Philistines. Now, the rest of the story really, when you paraphrase it the way I'm going to describe it now, indicates very powerfully how God plays a role in all of that. It starts off by, in Judges chapter 13, where it indicates that after his birth, the Spirit of God began to stir him. So quite clearly, God was working uh, not dissimilar again, in some respects, to our Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God started to work in him. He would presumably have started to appreciate his role and, and, and God's relationship with him. But he then goes off on a rather dramatic tangent, but importantly, the record tells us that it was a God-inspired tangent, where he, quite to his parents' consternation, selects a Philistine wife. And importantly, as, as Judges chapter 4, 14, verse 4 tells us, this was really in order to establish the very confrontation that had to happen in order to liberate the Israelites from the Philistines. There had to be this confront, confrontation. We're then introduced very quickly in chapter 14 to Samson's strength, which is really what all of us know Samson's story to be about. And we're introduced of, around that through his killing of the lion. But again, the record indicates very carefully that that strength came through the spirit of the Lord. So it was God working with Samson that gave him the strength. It wasn't some superhuman being that was brought onto the earth. This was God's strength, God's spirit, God's power that was working in Samson. We also introduced quite early to the fact that Samson seemed to be very good at telling riddles by Judges chapter 14, verses 12 to 18. And this was first revealed at the feast he went down to with the Philistines. Um, and again, when you read it carefully, his ability to tell these riddles was another mechanism that God used in order to create this confrontation which had to exist between Samson and the Philistines in order to bubble it up into the crescendo where he would then start uh, taking the steps that he had to, as drastic as they were, in order to liberate the Israelites. But we were introduced quite quickly uh, after that to the fact that Samson had this weakness. He really described it, the fact that he, he gave in and in fairness to him, I'm also not particularly good with nagging, so he, uh, he gave in to the fact uh, he has this weakness for women, and particularly those who seem to, to nag him constantly, and that when he gave in to his wife and, and gave up the riddle that he had, um, he had uh, given to the Philistine men at the feast, and they were unable to answer it themselves, and then had to go about cajoling Samson's wife into getting it out of him. We know then that from that point on, God really stoked Samson's anger. And as a result of that anger building up in him because of what the Philistines had cheated and cheated him out of his uh, riddle, that really bubbled over into the fact that Samson started his mission and that ultimately commenced the process of him delivering the Israelites from the Philistines. By Judges 15, as I said to you in the introduction, the story really has gone from... Um, fast-moving story into a very bloodthirsty story because, as I've indicated there, hate stoked hate in chapter 15. There was hate on the side of the Philistines for Samson. There was hate on Samson's side for the Philistines. 
and, and really culminated, unfortunately, in the murder of Samson's uh, wife and her father by Judges chapter 15, verses 6 to 8. And at that point, where the escalation of the hate between Samson and the Philistines had grown, he makes this oath, which really fulfills a large portion of God's, um, of God's purpose for him by making this oath that he was then going to destroy uh, the Philistines for what they had done. And the record in chapter 15 ends with a very powerful statement after explaining all of those rather drastic and dramatic events that had happened between Samson and the Philistines by saying at that point, Samson became the leader of the Israelite for the next 20 years. That doesn't explain in any detail exactly what his leadership involved, but perhaps I mustn't step into what I'm warning everyone else to do to uh, uh, surmise too greatly, but perhaps what it's telling us is that through his killing of the thousands of, of Philistines, through his anger with them, he may have conjoled his, his fellow countrymen who at that point were perhaps very subservient to the Philistines, who were afraid of them, who weren't prepared to stand up against them. And what his leadership at that point, the level of anger and his strength and, and the power of God being with him, was perhaps able to, to cajole his countrymen to join him and to rise up against the Philistines and to, to, to move away from them as we know they ultimately did. And we then know that uh, the story of, of Samson really culminates in, in chapter 16, which we already discussed at some length, where Samson falls in love with Delilah. And ultimately, we know the story very well. He gives up his secret of his strength to her after the Philistines had, had um, offered her the money and she had accepted the offer and tried unsuccessfully on, on earlier occasions to get him to give up his secret. And by getting to him to give up his secret, she renders him powerless. Remember, as we said in the earlier slides, where we spoke about the meaning of Delilah's name being night and Samson being sun, power. It was really through giving up his secret that she was able to render him powerless. And what's important is that verse in chapter 20 of, of Judges chapter 16, where the record tells us that the Lord left Samson. And what we really take from that, and I think it's an important and powerful point, so we don't get lost in the storytelling part of it, we stick to the, the power of God, is that God is with you. God is with those who fear him and who love him and who submit to him. And the moment Samson had failed to submit to him, he had given up his secret, and albeit that he didn't cut his hair and a third person did, he had given up his ability uh, to, to keep that secret and to keep that power and to keep God with him. And in so doing, God's power, God uh, himself left Samson at that point. And we know the story very well from, from there on. The Philistines were then able to seize him and bind him. And to, uh, the first thing they did was to gouge out his eyes and to imprison him. But the story moves very quickly to the end. Where we're told that presumably over weeks or months that he had been in prison, his hair grows back. But most importantly, again, to not get lost in the storytelling part of it, the important part that the record tells us is that he repents. So the, the hair growing back is, is, is really the physical outpouring of his inner repentance, presumably sitting in prison with darkness. He was now in night full-time. He was effectively in Delilah full-time uh, because he couldn't see. And presumably, that brought him to a point where he was able to repent and repent properly. And we know that from the record that he then prays to God for to allow him at one last opportunity to fulfill his role and to serve God in the way that God intended to him to do. And, uh, and when the uh, Philistines decided to have some fun with him and to bring him out to entertain him, he got the young boy who was leading him around to uh, place him next to those uh, columns. And using the last of his strength, he was able to topple the, the columns and bring down the temple on, on uh, a number of people. So really the crescendo of his story is that he fulfilled God, God's role uh, for him and he fulfilled ultimately his lifelong vow to God. And I put a question mark there because perhaps that's another point for some discussion. But in fairness, I think that's really the way I read the story is that he, although he, he went off track for a little while, as, as all of us do, uh, he, he realized his errors of his way and he was able to bring himself back to God's uh, way and to, to his vow that he had made, this lifelong vow, and fulfill it. So if we just end off our uh, talk this evening with, with two slides. The first is to talk around Delilah's role um, and to just try and understand, uh, you may say it's fairly obvious, 
And I think there's an important point to take out of Delilah's role in Samson's story. As I've said to you earlier on, many have labeled, when you read um, discussions around the story of Delilah, have labeled her as heartless and evil. Um, some, in fact, focus more on her evil than on Samson's, which I, I think is somewhat unfair. Um, yes, clearly, as I've said in the third bullet point there, she was uh, evil or she committed evil or she committed sin uh, in many respects. She was weak. She was easily swayed. She was a lover of money. She was disloyal and she was devious. But Samson had his own excesses, as we know. Uh, Samson committed his own sin. And many of those character traits that we see in Delilah, are character traits that, that in one degree or another, hopefully not to the degree that, that Delilah has, but they all creep into our lives at some point or the other. So I think it's a little unfair to focus all the evil of the story on Delilah and forget about Samson's own weaknesses. Because I think by doing that, as I mentioned at the fourth point, we really miss what is a very simple, but I think probably the most powerful point of Delilah's role in the entire story. Because I think what her real role was to simply be the facilitator, the facilitator for the fulfillment of God's purpose and plan with Samson and the Israelites. Facilitator in a not dissimilar way to perhaps the way in which Hitler um, was a facilitator for God's ultimate purpose to bring back um, the land of Israel, to bring his people back uh, and create or recreate the nation of Israel. That's really, if you look and you distill down the story of Delilah or her role in Samson's story, is what she ultimately became. She became the facilitator to swing him um, uh, completely uh, to a point where he gave up all of that vow, all of the strength, all of his commitment to God, and um, in so doing, brought him to the very lowest point in his life. And to a point at which he had to come ultimately in order to realize what he had done wrong and to repent and to restore his vow with God. So it's a pivotal role. In fact, without Delilah, the story of Samson may have been very, very different. Uh, but our Lord God, knowing the beginning from the end, ultimately knew the character of Delilah and ultimately um, was able to fulfill his purpose and plan through her facilitation. So the reality is, although Delilah's role was powerful, it was shocking, but ultimately it was really very swift and ultimately very, very effective in fulfilling the purpose that God had for Samson. So lastly, if we end off just with some lessons we can take from Delilah, and there's probably many others, but I think these are a couple that are, are important. Firstly is the one that I've perhaps just made now, and the fact is that, that God is ultimately in control. We've got to remember that. Uh, it, it's evil and it's good in, in the world, and we mustn't assume that all only good, God directs only the good. We have to accept if we believe and we submit and we fear our God that he is in control of what happens, both good and evil. Secondly, her failings that we should appreciate, or perhaps failings which exist in more of us than we will appreciate. Again, hopefully we're not disloyal to our partners to the degree that Delilah was. But I think um, when we're quick to criticize her, we need to take a step back back and appreciate that a lot of those character traits that I've discussed with you this evening are in one way or another character traits that we all fall victim to or allow ourselves to fall victim to at some degree or at some level or the other. And uh, we need to accept, rather than criticize, accept that we need to learn from that and to avoid it, as I've made in the third point. We need to make sure we try and guard ourselves against falling into similar weaknesses that clearly both Samson and Delilah fell into. Really, the point is, and it's one that our Lord Jesus Christ made, and it's one that is made in many instances in the Bible, the fact that we cannot serve, serve both God and man. We really have to make our election, ultimately. We have to, as Joshua says in chapter 24 and verse 15, we have to choose ye this day whom ye, shall, whom ye will serve. 